Hello, and welcome to Crime Labs. As always, please like and subscribe to our channel to help us grow a voice for victims. Today, we will be covering the case of John Charles Thomas Price. In the 1990s, John Price, known to his friends as Pricey, was living happily with two of his three children in the small town of Aberdeen in New South Wales, Australia. John was working hard in the mines surrounding the town, bringing in a steady income for himself and his children, and was known as a terrific guy. He was liked by everyone in the small country town. And because Aberdeen was such a small town, John soon met a woman named Catherine Knight in a local bar in 1993, and it wasn't long before rumors started to swirl around the town that the two had become an item. Both John and Catherine were divorcees. They both came into this new relationship with children, John having three, two of whom were living with him, a teenage boy and girl, and Catherine having four, three girls and one boy. The couple were more than happy to join their families together and enjoyed spending time together along with their children, either at John or Catherine's separate homes. John knew that Catherine had been married once before and had two relationships prior to their meeting, and even though his friends kept telling him that Catherine had a dark past, he would never really know the full extent until it was too late. Catherine's marriage to her husband, David Collette, lasted 10 years, from 1974 to 1984, but the decade of their marriage was rocky, to say the least. During those 10 years, David would suffer physical abuse from Catherine. On their wedding night, David had woken to Catherine attempting to strangle him, with Catherine giving the reason that it was due to David having sexual intercourse with her only three times. The abuse on David continued, even while Catherine was heavily pregnant with her first child. It was during this period that David arrived home late one night, only to be met with Catherine's rage. Catherine responded to David's late arrival by burning all of his clothes and shoes before hitting him over the back of his head with a large frying pan. Fearing for his life, David fled to his neighbor's home for safety. It was in 1976, shortly after the birth of their first child, Melissa Ann Kellett, that David, unable to take any more of Catherine's violent behavior, left Catherine and moved 900 miles away to his hometown in Queensland with another woman. The day after David left her, Catherine was seen in the main street of Aberdeen, violently throwing the pram which was holding baby Melissa side to side. It was because of this that Catherine's family admitted her into St. Elmo's Hospital, where she was diagnosed with postpartum depression and spent several weeks recovering. Being deemed as fit to care for her baby, Catherine was released from hospital. However, only a short time later, Catherine was seen by a local man, known as Old Ted, placing baby Melissa on a railway line shortly before a train was due to pass, before stealing an axe from a nearby property, going into the main street, and threatening to kill several people passing by. Old Ted thankfully rescued baby Melissa before the train passed by. Catherine was arrested and again taken to St. Elmo's Hospital, where the following day she deemed herself recovered and signed herself out. Only a few days after signing herself out of St. Elmo's Hospital, Catherine held up a woman in her car, slashing her face and demanding that she drive her to Queensland so that she could find David. With some quick thinking, the woman was able to get away from Catherine and alert the police by driving to a nearby gas station. But by the time police had arrived, Catherine was now holding a little boy hostage by threatening him with a knife. Police were able to disarm Catherine and, after arresting her, admitted her into Morissette Psychiatric Hospital, where Catherine admitted to the nurses that she intended to kill the mechanic at the gas station because he had fixed David's car, which had allowed him to leave her. And once she had arrived in Queensland, she had intended to kill David David and his mother. Even knowing this information, when David was alerted by police that his ex-wife was being held in Morissette Psychiatric Hospital, he left his new girlfriend and, along with his mother, moved back to Aberdeen to help support Catherine's recovery. Catherine's support team were happy with her recovery and made the decision to release her from hospital under the care of David and his mother, and the three of them, along with baby Melissa, moved to Brisbane, where Catherine quickly gained employment at Denmore Meatworks as an abattoir and David as a truck driver. In 1980, Catherine gave birth to their second child, Natasha Marie Collette, and life seemed great for the Collettes, at least until 1984, when David arrived home from work one night, only to find the house stripped bare and his wife and two daughters gone. He didn't have to worry for long, though, because it only took one phone call for him to find out that Catherine had packed up their home and daughters, and they were moving onto her parents' farm in Aberdeen. 
Catherine quickly gained employment at the meatworks outside of Aberdeen, again as an abattoir, and returned to her maiden name. But she realized even quicker that she didn't want to be living under the rules of her parents, and so she rented a small home for herself and her two daughters at nearby Muswell Brook. Catherine and her two young daughters lived in this home until 1985, until Catherine obtained a severe back injury at work, which resulted in her having to resign and survive off of a government disability pension. No longer needing to be close to the slaughterhouse, Catherine requested government housing in Aberdeen so her daughters would be closer to their school and friends. Her request was granted in 1986, and the family were soon moving into a small two-bedroom home on McQueen Street. While living on McQueen Street, Catherine would frequent the local hotels, like most others in the area. And it was in one of these hotels that she met Dave Saunders. Dave was a 38-year-old miner who was a divorcee and described by friends and his ex-wife as a nice and polite guy. When Catherine and Dave met, they clicked instantly, and within only two months of dating, Dave moved from his apartment in nearby Scone into Catherine's home on McQueen Street. Almost instantly, though, Catherine's possessiveness took over, and she began to accuse Dave of having affairs before kicking him out of her home. He would return to his apartment in Scone, and she would follow, apologizing and begging him to come back. And he would, but she didn't stop there. During one of their more explosive arguments in 1987, Catherine cut the throat of Dave's dingo puppy in front of him before rendering him unconscious by hitting him in the head with a frying pan, similar to what she had done to her first husband. Through all of this brutality, Dave forgave Catherine, and they continued their lives together with Catherine's two daughters on McQueen Street until 1988, when Catherine gave birth to her third child and Dave's first, Sarah Saunders. It wasn't long after giving birth to Sarah that the couple found themselves in yet another argument, and Catherine would, again, become violent. Catherine hit Dave across the face with a clothing iron and stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors before he was able to flee to his apartment in Scone, where he stayed for a week before calming down enough to return to the McQueen Street home. Once he arrived, he was met with a sight of his possessions covering the floor of the home, all cut into small pieces. This time, he decided he wasn't going to put up with Catherine's behavior anymore. Dave took long service leave from his work in the mines and went into hiding. Once Catherine realized this, she began frantically looking for him, but eventually gave up when her search came up empty. After a few months of silence, Dave returned to Aberdeen to visit his baby daughter Sarah, only to find that Catherine had taken out a restraining order against him so that he would be unable to visit her or their daughter. In 1990, Catherine found herself in a new relationship with another man she met in a local hotel, John Chillingworth. John was a 43-year-old man who worked at the Meatworks in Aberdeen. Much like her previous relationships, the pair would have explosive arguments in which John had admitted to hitting Catherine one time after she had smacked his glasses off of his face and broke the false teeth in his mouth. But again, like her previous relationships, none of this stopped the pair from welcoming a baby boy in 1991, Eric Chillingworth, Catherine's fourth child and John's first. Catherine and John stayed together for three years, but for the last year of their relationship, Catherine had begun to have an affair with another man, a man named John Price. In 1993, John Charles Thomas Price was living with two of his three children. His marriage had ended a few years earlier in 1988. However, his ex-wife had taken custody of their youngest child, while the two oldest children, Rebecca Price and John Jr. Price, had stayed in John's care. The Prices lived a happy life in a three-bedroom home on St. Andrew Street in Aberdeen, with John working hard in the nearby mines and occasionally celebrating the end of the workday at the local hotel, drinking beer with his friends. He's known by these friends as Pricey, and they describe him as a terrific guy who would give you his left arm if you needed it. When Catherine and John Price met at the local hotel in 1993, he had heard the rumors about the way she had treated her previous partners, but decided to give her a chance, and at first, he was glad he did. Catherine was a devoted, loving, supportive partner who would cook and clean. Her children loved John and his children and vice versa. But just like her previous relationships, this side of Catherine wouldn't last forever. After two years of being together, in 1995, Catherine and her children moved into the Price family home and almost immediately the accusations and the fighting began. Another two years continued on like this, with the addition of Catherine constantly pressuring John to marry her, but coming from a failed first marriage, John wasn't in any rush to get married again, and he would tell Catherine this, but she would continue to pressure him. 
One day in 1998, after yet another argument, Catherine went to the nearby mines where John worked to show John's employer a video she had secretly taken of stolen items that John had taken home from the mines. These items were things that were considered to be trash and were taken from the company's trash tip, but this didn't stop the company from firing John immediately, even after giving his service for the past 17 years. When John arrived home, he immediately kicked Catherine and her children out, and surprisingly, she listened. Catherine and her children moved back into their home on McQueen Street, while John told his friends and locals about what Catherine had done. The couple couldn't seem to stay away from each other for long, though, and after a few months, John took Catherine back but he refused her request to move back into his home because nothing had really changed. They still fought just as much, but he couldn't seem to live without her. In 2000, after a series of assaults during their arguments, John went to the local authorities to file a restraining order against Catherine, which they granted, but now John was understandably worried about how Catherine would react to the news. The same day he obtained the restraining order, the 29th of February, 2000, John told his work colleagues, if I don't come to work tomorrow, it's because she's killed me. They pleaded with him not to go home, but he was worried that if he didn't, she would hurt his children, and so he went home. But when John arrived home, he found an empty house, no children, and no Catherine. But he soon found out that Catherine had sent all the children to a sleepover at a friend's house, so John was alone for the night. He went to his neighbor's house, where he spent the night until 11 p.m. before returning to his empty home to go to bed. John hasn't been asleep for long before a car pulled into his driveway. Catherine got out of the car, let herself into the house, and watched TV before taking a shower and waking John up to have sex. After they finished, John quickly fell asleep again, and Catherine rolled over to her side of the bed where she had planted a knife earlier in the day. She collected it from its hiding place, waited until John was in a deep sleep, and plunged it deep into his abdomen. Waking with a panic, John leapt out of bed and tried to turn on the bedroom light, but not before seeing the maniacal look in Catherine's eyes. John attempted to escape and even made it to the front door before Catherine lunged at him, dragging him back inside and proceeding to stab him a further 36 times, puncturing many vital organs and causing him to bleed out. Once John was dead, Catherine then proceeded to skin his corpse with what authorities later said was expert precision due to her work experience as an abattoir. She then hung John's skin from a steel meat hook in the entryway of his home, ready to be seen by his children when they returned from their sleepover the following day. But she still wasn't finished. Catherine continued to defile John's body by removing his head and slices of his buttocks, which she then cooked in his kitchen, along with some vegetables, serving the meal onto two plates with place settings, one for each of John's children. Catherine then returned to John's body in the hallway, now holding an old photograph of John and a handwritten note. She positioned John's body laying face up in a cross-legged position with his left arm draped over a bottle of soda and placed the photograph and note on top of the cabinet. The handwritten note reading, Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. Now play with little John's dick, John Price. These allegations were baseless and believed to be false. When Catherine was finally done, she returned to the kitchen where she attempted an overdose, consuming 15 pills of fluvoxamine, 20 pills of paroxetine, and 20 pills of promethazine before returning to John's bed and falling asleep. At 6 a.m. the following morning, John's neighbor noticed his car still sitting in his driveway, which was unusual as John was always at work by this time of the morning and the neighbor, knowing John's turbulent relationship with Catherine, was starting to get worried. So he called the police and gathered another neighbor to try to rouse John by knocking on his bedroom window. It wasn't long after this that John's employer also called the police, as it was highly unusual for John to miss work, and that morning he was nowhere to be found. At 8 a.m., police arrived at the home on St. Andrew Street, where they had to forcibly enter through the rear door when they didn't receive an answer from anyone inside the house. What police were confronted with was a shocking and horrifying scene, which became even worse the further they walked into the home. Hanging from a meat hook in the entryway of the home was a large piece of human skin and lying adjacent a headless, skinless human body with an extreme amount of blood covering every surface of the small home. After alerting the other attending police officers of their findings inside the home, they returned to the scene inside. They started in the kitchen, where, apart from the bloody handprints covering every surface, they found a large pot that was still slightly warm to the touch. Inside the pot, police immediately identified a skinned human head sitting atop cooked vegetables and stock. 
Next to the stovetop, set two plates with perfectly prepared meals and place cards with the names Becky and Jonathan, John's children's names. On the other side of the kitchen, police found empty blister packs of multiple medications, an empty beer bottle, a packet of cigarettes, and a gray coffee cup containing a white fatty substance believed to be from the deceased. Making their way further into the home, police found a large piece of human skin hanging from the doorway with a tuft of dark hair at the top and a small patch of hair in the middle. They moved into the entryway, where they quickly identified the skinless, headless body to be that of John Price. They also identified multiple stab wounds on the body, the most obvious being a large stab wound extending deep into his chest cavity. Police then moved to the cabinet near John's body, where they found a knife sharpening stone, a packet of cigarettes, a blood-stained watch, an old photograph of John Price, the handwritten note Catherine had left, and small pieces of flesh. As police followed the blood trail further into the home, they were met with a sight they weren't expecting. Catherine Knight was in John Price's bed at the end of the house, alive but in a deep sleep. Police immediately removed Catherine from the home, where she was sent to Maitland District Hospital via ambulance for treatment of her attempted overdose. While in hospital recovering, Catherine was intensely questioned regarding her involvement in John Price's death, but Catherine denied any involvement whatsoever, stating that she couldn't recall any details about the night in question. As far as she was concerned, she arrived at John's home, they had sex, and they both fell asleep. But despite this, one week later in a bedside trial, Catherine Knight was charged with the murder of John Price. Catherine Knight pled guilty when her trial started in October 2001. However, her lawyer asked the court if she could be excused from hearing some of the details of the murder. This request was denied, and when Dr. Timothy Lyons took the stand to describe the skinning and decapitation of John, Catherine became hysterical and had to be sedated. It's important to note here that Catherine Knight's legal team had planned to defend her by claiming amnesia and dissociation. However, during numerous psychiatric evaluations, she was considered to be sane and had shown no remorse for her crimes. On the 8th of November, 2001, Justice Barry O'Keefe sentenced Catherine Knight to life imprisonment and refused to fix a non-parole period, ordering that her papers be marked as never to be released. Justice O'Keefe pointed out the nature of the crime and Catherine's lack of remorse required such a severe penalty. In 2006, Catherine appealed the life sentence, claiming that the penalty of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole was too severe. This was investigated by Justice Peter McClellan, Justice Michael Adams, and Justice Megan Latham, who formally rejected this appeal in September 2006, writing that this was an appalling crime, almost beyond contemplation in a civilized society. Catherine Knight is now 66 years old and carrying out her sentence at Silverwater Women's Correctional Center, where she will stay with no possibility of ever being released. Most importantly, though, let's hold a moment of silence in memory of the victim of this horrific crime, John Charles Thomas Price. Thanks for watching Crime Labs on YouTube. Please click here to watch our other videos.